Welcome to the show, everyone. My guest today is JV Crum the Third. So JV and I just got connected yesterday by a mutual contact, and what an incredible conversation! And we just immediately said, "All right, we need to have each other on our podcast." So JV is the owner and the uh, producer of a number of podcasts around his brand of Conscious Millionaire and Limitless Living, Limitless Leadership. And he's just such an interesting individual. We got into a conversation about the fact that he knew at the age of five that he was going to be a quote-unquote millionaire. And now the number didn't really even matter, this idea of like a millionaire, a billionaire, a trillionaire. Okay, they're numbers. It was more the conscious choice to say, I will be wealthy. I will be abundant. I will be limitless abundance. And we dove deep onto that. What does that actually mean? Because I know even personally, I, as as an entrepreneur for the last 20 years or so, I long thought that I could think my way intelligently through challenges and problems into the solution and the desired result. And now that's not to say that intelligence and tactics are not important in life and business. It keeps us alive. It allows our businesses to grow, all of these things. But there's also this element of just surrendering to what is and believing differently, thinking thinking differently to be able to actually get you to your desired place, but not being attached to the how or the why or even the people that are on that journey with you, just trusting, surrendering completely. And it was such an interesting, deep conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy this. And then, of course, too, he also mentioned about a workshop that he has coming up, which I will be sure to link up. You're going to see it down below this video. Make sure to attend that. It is something that is a foundational piece. I know it's been a critical piece for me on my journey. And I'm actually really looking forward to seeing how JV teaches this as well, this whole idea of seven uh, mindset shifts that you need to embrace and integrate in order to really step into that greatest version of yourself. So let's go ahead and give this one a listen. All right. Welcome, JV Crum. So good to see you again. We obviously just met yesterday, but here we are again. Well, I know because it's the 20, it's 24 hours. Like if you don't have a date within the next 24 hours, they don't, they don't really like you. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah, and all that That's stuff. Oh, true. we got to count. We got to count to seven days. Um, yeah. No, I don't, I don't actually recommend counting to seven days. I think you know, you meet the one, go for it. There you go. Right. Yeah. There was. There was no. Yeah. I'll, I'll be in touch. There was none of that at the end of our last call. It was. Let's go no, do this. No, no. Let's hop on let's another go, chat. Let's record. Let's hop on another stuff. chat. That's right. Yeah. 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 We're both. We're both fortunate people because we live in the flow and that's what ha- literally that's what I teach people uh, because when you live in the flow this stuff happens all the time synchronicity and, and synchronicity is also miracles you know it's not a word that I used until two months ago but I'm going you know it's magic it's miracles it's synchronicity it's it's all the same stuff mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and the truth is we can manifest it in our lives all we want and I prefer to manifest all that because it's just amazing to watch you know what's interesting is to watch when, because I live in flow, I teach flow, how the mosaic of life comes together that I didn't have to do anything to make it come together. Right. Right. I just have to surrender to allow myself to notice that it's coming together and be aware and be present. I go, God, life is so interesting. It's magnificent. Every day is magnificent, and we're for, so fortunate to get to play this game called being a human being. Absolutely. Well, and I want to dig into all of that stuff, everything you just referenced there, because I know many people that'll be listening to this, and then including myself, I hear you say that, and I think about the person that I was, say, as few as like six months ago, where I wanted to feel like I had control over everything and that I could just strategically and tactically get myself to that desired result. And I dove deep on vision and I said, here's the plan. And it just never, ever worked out like that. (laughs) And it wasn't until I started to, and you use the word surrender to just whatever is. And then even, I know we talked about this on the last time we chatted too, 
This idea that that future vision of my life already actually exists. I just need to step into it and believe it. That was like, poof, to me, six months ago, I was like, that's crazy talk. You know, we're talking, I'm an intelligent person. I can make everything happen in my life. <laughs> but what you're referencing here is so, so true. And I can't wait to dig even deeper into that. But really quickly, though, do you want to maybe just give everybody a, a quick introduction with regards to who you are? I see Conscious Millionaire in the background there, which for those of you that don't know, conscious he is the Conscious Millionaire. And... That word obviously means a lot. And I think people are really, especially in these times, resonating with this idea of what does it mean to be a conscious human being, let alone a conscious millionaire and the tie to money and everything else. So, Well, abs- absolutely. So um, the conscious, conscious millionaire came to me in 2004 in a hot tub in Reno, Colorado. All the Reno, best Colorado. Things. Reno, Nevada. I had been over to... Uh, to uh, San Francisco for the weekend. It's a three and a half hour freeway drive. So you just, if you don't mind being on 25,000, you know, lanes at one time, you just get on it and stay on it. And then you're at San Francisco, right? And I had been walking around San Francisco and I saw this, you know, how they have all these stands with stacks of kinds of free magazines. And this one was called Green Festival. And at that moment in time, I knew absolutely nothing about green or sustainability or anything. But for some reason, the cover caught my attention. I, you know, said, oh, I'll put this in my SUV. And I got back to the place that I'd rented with a hot tub. And I got in the hot tub and I'm kind of thumbing through it. And I had for a couple of years been thinking I had sold companies and I was out living my dharma, finding why am I here on the planet? What is the big thing I should do with my life? And I looked down, and, and this is about a 100-page brochure about all these different speakers, and there was this word conscious. And my intuition is very visual. Everybody's intuition is visual, auditory, kinesthetic for most people. And in my mind's eye, which is pretty active, I get phrases, I get numbers, I get sentences, and I saw conscious millionaire. I got a tingling in my spine, and for about two or three years, I've been going out and camping for like two or three weeks at a time. And I'd have these little conversations with the universe. I actually say them out loud. And I go, okay, look, I'm tired of waiting. I'm ready. Tell me why I'm here. <laughs> uh, to which there was no answer. And then <laughs> right. all of a sudden, yeah, I'm going, okay, this is not working too well. I'll build the fire bigger. And so then all of a sudden, there it is. And I tingling my spine. And I knew just like that. I knew. This is why I'm on the planet. Mm. And I, knowing how the universe works, I stayed in the hot tub another 40 minutes and just reveled in the fact that I um, found I my you. dharma. I found my purpose. And so I'm drying off as that I'm walking to the computer to look for consciousmillionaire.com, which of course was waiting. Mm-hmm. Uh, realized I had just been given my assignment. And I'd never even thought in those terms. And this kind of came into my mind. I went, oh, now the assignment did not come with a book that tells you what Conscious Millionaire is. It turns out I was supposed to write that book, which I have, but <laughs> early, uh, but initially I'm just going, oh, that's such a cool phrase. That's what I'm going to be doing. That's so cool. I wonder what it is, right? I had no idea, right? I was like, oh, it's a cool phrase, you know? And then as I wrote the book and I started creating audio programs and everything, I discovered, oh, this is about finding a visionary way to build your business that impacts humanity and makes you rich at the same time. It's like now you have two outcomes and it turns out the way I put the model and teach it to people that it's, it is exactly by coming from your heart into your vision and from the vision, deciding on the impact, that's the order it occurs. And then putting the business model together, right? That impact which we would call in marketing terms an offer, but it's an impact brings money to you. So now you're turning your purpose into a vision, into an impact that brings money to you. And that's a conscious millionaire business. And I help people do that at all kinds of levels, five and six, seven and eight, depends on where they are, how much they want to build it. Um, And I particularly am attracted to working with people and attract people to work with me who want to play big in particular. And they really want to make a big impact with their lives. And what's great is that we have reached a point that that's all possible. 
that you can be 100% focused on making an impact and 100% focused on being rich. With some people, I have to like work on the money mindset part. So I have seven money mindsets that I work with. And because they've got to feel okay first and then excited that this thing of getting rich and making a difference in the world fit together. Because a lot of times people who have the conscious path also have a scarcity money path because they've been taught, and I grew up being taught that, I just didn't uh, choose to believe it, that making money is a bad thing. It's a greedy thing. And I go, well, not if you're making your money by helping the world become more conscious. That's not greedy at all. That's why you're here. And you make more money, you can play bigger and impact more people's lives. So, and then you can give the causes that you you want. You know, so it's, it, it's it all reframe. works synergistically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You said a couple of things there that really stood out. And I mentioned to you before we started this interview that I don't have any prescripted questions because I trust that we will exactly dance to where we need to go to here right now in the same context of what you're saying. And I actually struggled with that no like a year ago, like I wanted everything pre-scripted and recorded and all of these things structured, but my most authentic conversations with people happen when I just pick up on something you said that resonated. And there was a couple of things, but one in particular was, so Conscious Millionaire comes to your mind and you go look for the manual naturally. Okay, somebody must have thought of this idea already. It doesn't exist. And you said, I was supposed to write it. What was that feeling for you at that time? Did you feel like and I am this person to write it. Or did you feel like, well, where do oh, I no, I, I, I know, I, I know question. I had immediate buy-in. So it's really a discovery process. And, and I'm still discovering because I, you know, I, in, 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 in human terms, you'd say I fathered it, but I would say that it, uh, it came through me mm. and that the universe chose me because I would be the right person, right? And I was also seeking. So there's two pieces to that. The universe is choosing me, but I I spent three years really camping out two or three weeks at a time seeking and kind of getting a little frustrated along the way, actually. You know, I'm going like, uh, I'm ready. But then after I got it, I realized I hadn't been ready. I would not have been ready until the moment I got it. Yeah. That's interesting too, because it's we always want to buy into the idea of creating a vision and then working back with goals and intention and ways and uh, behaviors and habits and ways of being and stuff and say, that is the path. But the surrender word that you used earlier too, I've found to be the most impactful thing in my life, which has components of all of that stuff I just said. Like you can't just show up and hope and pray that something's going to come. You have to still put in the work and you have to, you know, be intentional about it and work through that. But surrendering to the idea that the universe is choosing you for something and now it's whether or not you're going to see it at the time that you're supposed to, or if you're going to have these blocks. And you just said earlier too, you grew up with around you the idea that money is bad, but you chose not to believe that. Do you want to maybe give everybody a little context to your background that brought you to that point in the hot tub as well? Like what was life yeah, before yeah, that? Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, the, my attraction to water is that I grew up in a little country town on a four by five mile lake. So everybody was broke. It was definitely scarcity mindset kind of stuff. But we're on a four by five mile lake. So my uh, number one uh, connection to the planet is water. Whitewater rafting, I was on the swim team, scuba diving, skiing, water and snow. You know, it's all, there's always a water connection when I feel, you know, I'm at my happiest in living in, in Colorado when I go out in the mountains and I find a stream. They call them rivers here, but um, if you grew up in Florida, these are not rivers, these are streams. And, but they're happy calling them rivers. And I'll just sit by it and I'm just happy. I'm in bliss. Or the Big Sur Coast. You know, and the tempestuous um, ocean hitting up against rocks that's 300 feet below you. That is very comforting and very spiritual for me. So I grew up in this little country town. And at the age of five, I went through a major pivot. I went by James then. Mm. And I didn't have any brothers and sisters. So my mother would take me with her wherever she went because couldn't just leave a little five-year-old at home. And we'd go to the grocery store. 
And I can remember her giving me lectures before we got out of the car. And she'd go, now, James, don't ask for the candy bar. And then she would explain to me, because she kind of talked to me like an adult. It was an interesting household. And, uh, and she'd explain that we didn't have any money and people would think we were poor. And she didn't want people to think we were poor. So I should not ask for the candy bar. So I, I didn't ask for the candy bar. But one day when I was five, as little kids will do, you know, that one of the great things about the mindset of little kids is that anything's possible. As adults, I get paid to help people return to that place if anything is possible because, yeah, because they've got all these things that aren't possible. And so I'm like, going, well, what's, you know, really, what's the solution to me getting a candy bar? You know, and I watch television and, and the rich people had nicer homes than we did, a lot nicer, actually, and nicer cars, you know, and uh, took much nicer vacations. And I said, those people can afford a candy bar. And so I literally had a moment where I just said it out loud. And I can remember I was standing by the kumquat tree. You know, like I know exactly where I was in the neighbor's yard. We had a tangerine tree, but they had a kumquat tree. I said, I know I'll become a millionaire when I grow up. I (laughs) ran in the house as if I had discovered water. And I told both my parents, they were in the kitchen. I remember it all. And my mother, she shook her finger at me and she said, don't you tell anybody. Which is bizarre as it can be when you even hear it, right? Uh, So first of all, like any good little five-year-old, boy or girl, I went around town doing exactly what I would tell a client to do. (laughs) Knocking on doors to declare to the entire community that I had decided to become a millionaire. I wanted everybody to know that I was, I was a millionaire, you know? And uh, when I wrote my book, my editor, well, first there were two, two insights. My editor says, JV, you must explain that sentence that I just told you. Because readers are going to want to know, why did your mom tell you not to tell anybody? And I said, well, I have no idea. And I actually had to contemplate that about six months. It took me a while to write my book. Um, we were the family that lived across the street from the church, and we went to church three times a week. And my mother believed if you had that much money, you must be a criminal. You must have uh, taken advantage of people. So what she was saying was, don't become a criminal. Now, fortunately, as a little kid, I didn't take any of that in. The other thing that was interesting is that my uh, editor said, Chafee, do you know how unusual it is that you decided to be a millionaire at five? And I said, what are you talking about? She says, well, that's not what most people do. And I said, really? I had been walking around my whole life thinking every person on the planet, because I never mentioned this as a little kid, you know, to anybody other than going around and declaring it once and it was done. I thought everybody decided to be a millionaire at five. And I was just one of the ones who did it. She goes, no, they actually don't make that decision. I said, really? And it was actually astounding to me because I knew I wanted that candy bar. And I was certain if I became a millionaire, I could buy the candy bar. So to me, it was just like so clear as a little five-year-old, well, this is the obvious answer. If you're a millionaire, and, and, I, and I did think I could probably get some other stuff too. Candy bar, you know, at eight, I was drawing pictures of mansions. And this is kind of funny. I'd never been in a mansion, but I saw them on television. Uh, I did not yet know there were things you could do in a bedroom other than sleep. And I was not the kid who wanted to go to bed and sleep. So I drew a mansion with no bedrooms. It had three rooms, a breakfast, a lunch, and a dining room, because I knew I liked to eat. It had a big playroom. It was huge, because I knew I liked to play with my toys. And then we lived on a lake, so you make up this stuff, right? Right. So I made up that people who live on lakes are poor. Mm, That's interesting. And people who have pools, because nobody had a pool, are rich. So I had a house with a kitchen, a big playroom, three rooms to eat in, and a huge pool with cabanas around it. And that was the entire mansion, right? (laughs) Because I didn't have any need for any other rooms. 
<laughs> right? So it's kind of interesting how we create the um, the world, but that's how people work as adults too. That's how they stay in what I call the box, the scarcity box, and never change. And 10 years later, they're making the same amount of money with the same kind of friends, taking the same kind of vacations because they've never gotten out. And I've identified there's seven mindsets that you have to develop around money in order to go live this liberated life where you can make all the money that you want and also simultaneously impact the world at all the levels that you want to impact the world. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the context of where I, from whence I came. Yeah, and I know we won't have time to get into all seven of those, but I'll make sure to share um, some resources with everybody on how you can go and learn oh, about yeah. these seven. Well, I, te- I teach those in my first million masterclass. Yeah, no, and I'm excited to uh, to experience it and then also share it with people in my world as well. Yeah, I. Great. But maybe you want to share one. Do you want to maybe dig into one of those? Because um, yeah, so let's start with the Latin first. The, yeah, yeah. The first one is um, on abundance mindset. That's where you start, and that unfortunately, I've read a lot of books on mindset because it's my you know my area of expertise. Um, most mindset books start and end on beliefs, and that's just one. And it's actually the surface level, even as important as it is. So imagine that there's this continuum between scarcity and I don't call it abundance. I call it limitless abundance because I think that gives a better picture. It's like, it's not just abundance. It's limitless abundance. But you have tens of More than enough for everybody, right? It's more than enough for for everybody. Yeah, it's limitless, right? And you have tens and probably hundreds of thousands of beliefs because everything you and I say are based on beliefs and assumptions we've made about reality. Well, even what you were just saying about the lake and the pool, my first thought was, wait a second, people actually try and buy houses on lakes now. But again, that's just that one example of where my head went. But then you said pool. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, pools. I would associate pools to being rich too, you know? Yeah, it's, it is interesting because that same lake now, people are building little mansions on it. I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah, because that's the world we live in now, yep. you know? But um at any rate, so you have tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of beliefs, but they're not all scarcity and they're not all a, this limitless abundance. They're all a, along this. And our job, and I have you know exercises and techniques I put people through, is to shift to where we're living in a world where a lot of our beliefs are around limitless abundance, because that changes how we look at money, how we look at our business, how we look at clients, how much we charge. You know, and it also changes what we receive because it's at this level that we've got to deal with the things that we've already been talking about. Money's bad or a pie is a good way to think about it. There's only one pie. Now, if there's only one pie, we've got several problems. One of the problems is I'm probably going to have to fight and struggle to get my little slice of that pie. And then we got the guilt stuff, like my mom. Oh, well, if I get my slice, is is there enough for everybody else? Because there's only this one pie. And now probably I had to take advantage of them. And we get into what I call first stage capitalism, as opposed to where I live in conscious millionaires, second stage. I'll I'll quickly give those in a minute. But in first stage, it's all about win-lose. And there are 100 pennies and a dollar. But only 100. And your goal, and this is CNBC, I'm not knocking CNBC, I'm just saying this is what they, this is how they report. Your goal is to get all hundred if you can, because you don't really care if anybody else gets any. You want to have them all, right? So that's the win-lose model. And I call that first stage of capitalism. And that's still where most people are staying. And then you have people who go, oh, well, capitalism's bad. They go, no, capitalism's not bad. First stage of capitalism is pretty limiting. That's the reframe. Second stage is a win-win-win, and that's what I built it on. You, others, and humanity all winning together, right? And it's also based on limitlessness, which actually is true. And you know who first discovered this on a practical level in business was actually the tech companies in the 90s. As you think about, that's when tech started getting big. How many people in their genes you know, and sneakers went to work and became millionaires and they were just programming. 
And it's because the tech companies realized that it was infinite. It was limitless. So if they could make their techie people millionaires, well, they were staying, right? And the company was going to do well as well. And there were certainly not just 100 pennies in a dollar. There are millions of pennies in a dollar. It just depends on whether you want to mine them all. And I don't mean in the crypto way. Mine them in your mind. And But this whole shift to you, others, and humanity winning together, I can assure you that if you are focused If you and I are doing business and I'm focused on you winning and humanity being better off, I will absolutely do better. You know, and I look at people like Jeff Bezos, who I think is the epitome of this stage one, because pretty much I can just say this, you know, because he's not coming on my show. Um, (laughs) You know, what's the truth? There's a there's a solid foundation of truth here, even if it's uh, has bias and beliefs and everything around it. So I appreciate just. Say whatever comes to your heart. They're running advertisements right now bragging that their people make $15 an hour. Well, if you make $15 an hour and you live in a real city, you can't buy a car or rent an apartment. This is not possible. Right. So I don't know why they're bragging about that, you know? So my point is that he certainly has done really well, but I think he's still living in that first stage where he wants to gather all the the money for himself. And he hasn't really got that he could pay those same people $25. And you could actually make that work. He just doesn't see it that way. He sees it from that skill. And I know he's seeing it that way because that's what results you get when you think like that. You you set up businesses like that. And on the other hand, you can set up a business where everybody's going to prosper. There's going to be food for everybody in the world. There's going to be shelters. There's going to be water. There's going to be health care. And you If you come from that scarcity place, there's only so much, then you can't even conceive. You go, oh, no, if all those third world countries get to live like we live, we'll have to give up something. Well, maybe not. Maybe we just all get to live better. And guess what? If people have education and they have food to eat and they have health care, they're going to be more productive. The whole world's going to be more productive. But you can't see that from the scarcity place. But when you move over here from limitless abundance, Your mindset is one of, oh, it's how many ways can we win as opposed to there's only one way. You know, I I was just doing a training this morning and I said, I was talking about competition in that in the scarcity part of the belief system, you've got to crush your competition. You know, well, you know, you're you're coming on my show of 3,100 episodes. I actively seek out people that would be called my competitors. We're in similar businesses. I invite them on my show. And you know what I find out? In the first five, 10 minutes before we go to recording, I know if we're ever going to do business together. Because if they're coming from the scarcity place, they'll never be able to do business with me. Because they'll be too afraid. I'm going to come take all their clients or something. But if they're over here playing this limitless abundance game, Ah, now we can look at ways to collaborate because we can be doing the same topic and still find ways to play together and bigger. And our people and their people and new people all win bigger because they get exposed to trainings they wouldn't have gotten. You know, but if you think that you're the only person who can train mindset, then you can't have a mindset person on your show. Which is kind of crazy when you think about it, it, especially if it's mindset. Right, But it's interesting you're phrasing this as stages, though, too, because maybe some people just they're born to jump to that stage of believing in win, win, win. But I see more often than not that it kind of does go from that first stage to the second stage where you don't have that scarcity and you truly believe that the more that like me and you talking right now, I know we'll have a ripple effect. And that's what inspires me. I know that one of my gifts is to actually amplify the voices of the change makers of the world. It took me a long time to actually even own that. But then I realized, you know, like Malcolm Gladwell. And thank you for doing that because the change makers need to have a microphone and they need it to be bigger and louder. And that's why this podcasting game is so incredible, too. It's so amazing, isn't it? And as a lawyer, I go, isn't it interesting that we don't even have any rules or laws telling us what we can say? <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. Talk about true free speech. It's podcasts, right? 
when you mentioned earlier about, uh, I think it was MSNBC or something like that, saying like, oh, I'll say that out loud. I've had numerous conversations recently with people where they're saying that there's a mistrust of the media and for obvious reasons. And there's some truth to what the media, the mainstream legacy media does, and there's some falsehoods. Well, and my stuff about MSNBC, I was just simply saying that if you listen to, they do really good quality analysis, but they're really only interested in the profit part. They're really not talking about how does humanity better off. That's not, that's not their, their spit. And on that note, actually, this is where the dance is kind of nice when we start talking about these things. But you were talking about something that brought up a thought around how do we end world hunger in this world? Or how do we get clean drinking water to people in this world? How do we get clean sanitation systems to people in this world? And I know personally, there's there's been moments, especially even in the last couple of years, where I'm like, oh, how do you do that? And what kind of impact am I really going to create on that? And then I realized that just conversations like this actually start to get us in that direction because you change the narrative of how people think and what is possible. And all of a sudden you start thinking of solutions. And I heard one the other day, and maybe it's not the best solution, but somebody has introduced the idea of you want to end world hunger, you need to give cheap energy to everybody on the planet, especially poorer people. Because then they have the ability to actually grow their own food and to manufacture stuff. And It is interesting. Um, I'm a member of Peter Diamandis group, so I consume his material, uh, you know, voraciously, actually. And that's one of the things he's been talking about recently about solar, is that the real, the places that solar energy is going to work the best happen to be regions that are very poor right now. And now they're going to put up solar and everybody can get energy. And that makes a whole lot of difference. Changes the world. It really does. And, and I know you even mentioned about green earlier on too. I think that's one of the challenges in the framing of how you're even saying it. It's we want to go carbon neutral. We want to go green everything. And yes, of course, we want to save this planet. We want to, if we want to exist, we better. But the idea of saying well, we need to just turn all of these things that we've done forever off and go straight over to this. Even the people that are on that side of the green technology are saying, yeah, no, we can't do that. <laughs> we need to work our way slowly here. Well, and probably realistically, we can do that in 30 or 40 years. Right, yeah, it's just not like a tomorrow thing. Yeah, there has to be a plan to be able to get us there and an intention to actually be of service to everybody, not just the wealthy, right? But it's interesting that we're talking about this though, too, because I just said that out loud. And then I actually caught myself thinking like, well, what makes the wealthy? Well, naturally money is how we measure it right now, but who are the truly wealthy people of the world? Are they the ones that are free in their minds of thinking with this limitless abundance? Or are they the ones that believe that there is actually scarcity and I need to own as much as possible? Yes, because it, it certainly, um, a friend of mine who works with very high level people told me a few years ago, and he goes, you know, JV, this is what I have found, right? And that's the people he circulates with. And it's the people, you know, where his home is and everything, billionaires. He goes, when people get to about um, 500 million, they may have had great intentions, but then the money greed becomes the whole game that they start playing. You know, I mean, Jeff Bezos started out in a different place than he is now, right? He started out, let's figure out how we can make books more efficient. Uh, that's certainly not the game he's playing now. But he says, I found that very few people at that level of wealth actually are playing what you and I are talking about. So it's interesting. There they are making billions of money. And you would think, well, that's limitless abundance. But if in their mind they're living in a scarcity world, they're scared not to get the next billion because they literally can believe that they're going to go broke or they won't have enough. This is a deeper conversation about how do you identify? Do you identify by externals? Because that's another one of the seven money mindsets. Is your identity about external or is your identity about who you are? Do you identify with what you have or who you become? 
And you become wealthy either way, but it'll be a very different journey. It's kind of like you can become a conscious millionaire or you can just make money. But if you're a conscious millionaire, by definition, the way that I frame it, the way that I teach it, you're doing something that's positively impacting people's lives and uplifting humanity and making this a better world. And that can come in so many different ways, but that it's about intention as much as anything else. You sent over a handful of links when I signed up to be on your podcast next week. And I listened to episode 2000. Oh, did you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This morning when I woke up and you had a, a really impactful question that you asked there about, do you want to maybe say it? I've got it written down here too, but the idea. Oh, go, go, um, go ahead. Sure. I got it written right here. It's who would you need to become and what impact would you need to make on humanity to become a billionaire in the next 10 years? Yeah. And I sat with that one for a good 30 minutes this morning where I was normally going to actually dive into my emails. And I was like, you know what? Let me think about this for a second. Is that I needed to give it time and space of, like, is this possible? What do I need to do? How do I, like, what, what can I create? And then I actually grounded back into, wait a second, I'm already doing it. I just need to keep going. I need to have conversations like this. I need to show up with the intent on knowing that when I raise others around me, I lift with them. And it was really grounding, actually, to know that I'm already on the path. and. It didn't start today. It started a number of years ago, but it was a choice too. And you've alluded to that a few times already, even as a five-year-old, I'm choosing to be a millionaire. Why do I have to live with a scarcity mindset and a poor mindset? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and it's a very important question because I tell people, I chose the billion because it interests me. You know, um, interest is not the right word. I'm asking that question. You know, I'm asking, how do I sell my current company for a hundred million? How do I start more companies that are venture backed? How do I play bigger? Uh, Those are the kind of questions that I'm asking. It doesn't have to be billion. Uh, For you, it could be a million or it could be 10 billion. It's the unleashing inside that it's all about. It's It's about unlocking who you are. And so the the point is to choose a number that seems quite out there for you, whatever that number is. Yeah, it could be anything, right? It could be 10 10 grand. It could be 100,000, whatever. But the question is, who do I need to become? That's identity. That's one of the, the seven money mindsets. And what's the impact? That's part of my visionary mindset, money mindset, right? What's the impact I'm making? But to help you realize that this wealth, whatever level it is, is a byproduct of impact. And so you've got to become somebody you're not today. And you've got to make an impact that you're not making today. That's called personal growth and evolution. And to me, that's why at least I'm on the planet. And I think it's why we're here, is to see how much can we grow and who can we become and how can we expand our own possibilities and by doing that, expand the possibilities for humanity. That's what um, I'm avidly studying a lot of technologies right now. That's what technology is all about. I mean, and the reason technology is so interesting is that's where the that's the game where most of the breakthroughs and curiosities and creativities um, are occurring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I'm still even digging deeper since I had <laughs> listened to that, and then now listening to you break it down even further as to like what does it mean to me? How, who do I get to become? And then also, you know, and also celebrate what's brought me to here, but then go now go deeper, now go deeper, now challenge that thought. And we we were talking about maybe we'll end on this. Is we were talking about spirituality and dimensions, and you were saying that. This is something that's been in you for a long time and you've seen the evolution of yourself even too. And you made a reference to being able to access these many levels of dimensions. Do you want to maybe speak to that knowing that we only got a few minutes here left? Well, well, actually we have a little bit longer. I was just checking. I have a text and the person I was going to meet with has now decided to do the later time. Look at that. There's the universe telling us. 
Well, you know, I want to comment on that. Because my show is six days a week, it's become a reference point for a lot of learning. And initially, a few years back, uh, it's still, there are people, I just interviewed somebody two weeks ago, it took me a year to get them on the show. Not because they didn't want to come, but they were writing a book and, you know, you just have to, when somebody's at a very high level of celebrity, you have to, you have to do it when it's right for them. And this was another one of those people. And the day of it, they had to cancel. And it's interesting because my first 30 seconds, that's about how long it lasted, was disappointment. And I went to scarcity, right? And then I went, oh, I teach perfect timing. My perfect motto is, my, my personal motto for over 30 years is trust perfect timing. And then that came into my mind. I said, oh, it'll all work out. It's just a different time. And then I started realizing that anytime somebody, I started paying attention, you know, like almost taking notes, but not taking notes, but taking them mentally, that it's not that often, but occasionally somebody has to cancel for some reason. They're sick, their daughter has to go to the doctor, whatever. And I learned from that experience, we actually did the recording three weeks later, and then they came back several times. I learned from that experience to realize that a deeper part of trust perfect timing. And because I had a context of interviewing all these people is that three weeks from now in this first situation, I'm not the same person. I've transformed. They are not the same person. They've transformed. And now we're going to have a, we might talk on some of the same topics, but it's not going to be the same conversation we would have had because we have both evolved in that 30 you know, in that three-week time period. So I made it part of my teachings. I said, okay, folks, look, everybody likes to make sales. And we all understand that. But sometimes people cancel. Some of those people do not reschedule. Here's what I want you to know. They were never going to buy in the first place. They just gave you an hour of your time back. Use it wisely. Mm -hmm. Right? And for whatever reason... They just decided to cancel. But if they were never going to buy in the first place, if they don't reschedule, then there was no eagerness or hunger for whatever it is you had to offer. And that may not be, you know, your fault. It may just be that they realized, you know, it's like right now I'm making a decision and uh, someone's made me an offer. I just did some business with them. So I just paid them some money for some stuff. And I made that decision like in five minutes and it was several thousand dollars. So they probably are confused right now, but that's okay. Um, Because they, you know, they invited me to be a part of their group. Well, I'm uh, taking, I'm going to take a few weeks to think about it because I'm now at, it made me aware, I was thinking of another group I was going to join the second half of the year. And I'm going, if I join this group, because I'm already in three groups, I'm at capacity. So it's not a decision, like they don't know this, you know, because I might also want to negotiate it, right? So they don't know this, but I'm going, yeah, it's it's actually not about them. I'm just having to make a decision. Is this going to be it? And now I'm full for the rest of the year. I can't, you know, there's no more options because there's only so much time I want to spend in groups, right? Or do I want to reserve that space? And I know that their group would be a great, value to me. That's not the issue. The issue is now I'm down to evaluating that versus another group I'm considering. And that's what happens. But you know what? I can guarantee you if I'm supposed to be in that group, I'll be in it. If I'm supposed to be in another group, I'll be in it. And that's ultimately how I make decisions. And ideally, it's how your prospects make decisions too. And it's not about you. It's about the totality of their circumstances And sometimes six months from now is the right time. I am not a proponent that my job in life is to trust, is to twist people's arms that now is the moment for them with me. It it may be at six months, just like it's not always the right day to do the podcast interview, even if I'm excited I'm interviewing this person, right? It may be that that another day is going to be a better day. 
back to surrender and trust. Because I know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this yourself, but I've gone through moments in my own entrepreneurial journey over 18 plus years where that deal didn't go through and you thought, oh my Lord, what am I going to do now? (laughs) As opposed to now, it might be a conversation that doesn't lead to that exchange of energy in the form of money. But it's perfect, whatever it was. And it all and it keeps showing up. I know for me personally, something else fills that, even if it's just silence and nothing. And that and that's good too. And that's one of the other major things that I've really leaned into in the last six months is that sometimes not being busy like you used to or not having all of the things aligned for you in the way that you thought they were going to is the greatest blessing that you have if you choose to actually slow down and embrace it as opposed to how do I go fill the void? That didn't work. No, it did work exactly how it was supposed to. (laughs) It worked exactly how it was supposed to. Just have to embrace it. Absolutely. And the surrender part, let's talk about that for a moment because I teach flow. And one of the things that at some point I I did that training again this week is I go, okay, I'm going to teach you how to be in control of being in flow anytime, any place you want and automatically creating synchronicity. And then I I pause because I want them to get that. And I go, but here's the paradox. The only way to be in control is to let go of all the control. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Know that. Because the only way to be in control that you're choosing to be in flow is to surrender and be in flow. That's the only way it works. I've been teaching this for a long time. It does not work any other way. Because if you want to get into the flow, you also, and I go, and I can teach you how to create synchronicity, but by the way, I can't tell you what it'll be because it'll be authentic for your soul. And I can't tell you what that will be. By you being authentic and just being open, the experience will happen. And then the other part of that, just to, to you know, keep the same metaphor of a river is that the river's going to unfold before you. You don't have to know where it is a mile from here because right now you can only be in the river here. You can't be a mile from here. And that's part of trust as well. You don't have to know. When I was five and decided to be a millionaire, you know, now because I teach this, I've broken it all down. But I had no clue how that was going to happen. But I had no question that it would. Right? So I was, we as adults, our minds oftentimes get attached to what has to happen this way. And that's, in my book, it was intentional. And I make it clear in the the intro paragraph to chapter seven. Chapter six, I teach you how to have your most productive, organized, and therefore scheduled day possible. And then in chapter seven, I teach you about how to be in the flow. So the introductory paragraph to that needed, and that's why I go, how do I put these both in the same book? And I go, oh, you teach them how to do this. And then in the introductory paragraph, I tell you, and by the way, to be in flow, you might have to throw all that out. And that's okay. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) That's okay. Because you actually learned a lot by going through the process of analyzing it all. Mm -hmm. And then... You know, I the best way to think about it is you may have a 90-day outcome or result you want to achieve. And you put together the plan. And that's, you know, that's important to do in your business. But when you're in flow, you might have that one conversation that somebody calls you or you read something on the internet or you listen to a podcast, you know, or you open a book, right? And all of a sudden you have an awareness, an insight. You, you become conscious of something. And you realize, I can do this in 24 hours. I just didn't know the pieces that I needed. I thought it had to happen this way, but it turns out if I use these pieces, it can happen much faster and much easier and with less effort. That's, to me, the magic of being in flow. You have to be willing to let go of anything you've even created and go, well, that was a lot of work. Yep. But do you want to do a lot of work for 90 days or would you just like to get this all done in 24 hours? Remove the resistance is powerful. It's powerful. 
you know? Yes. We, and, and what you just identified is correct. It, you are the resistance. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of stuff that I am committed to ensuring that my kids learn at a very young age. And it's something that's got me diving very deep. It's a, a, another reason why this podcast is so meaningful to me and why I feel it's actually a piece of the purpose that I'm here to do is that if I'm going to raise the consciousness of the next generation, starting with my kids, I got to be the example. I got to go show that I'm not going to attach to anything, that I'm actually going to be in flow and re remove the resistance and everything in between. So it's a powerful and uh, big responsibility as a parent, and, but I'm excited to lean into it. Uh, let's talk about First Million Masterclass, because I'd like to invite everybody, and I know you've got a link that you're going to give them. Uh, so yes. they can get that yes. from you. Yeah, come to the First Million Masterclass. What I do is I take you on a journey and I introduce you to all seven of the money mindsets and how to start using them. And I do a deep exercise on one of them so you get a really good feel for what this is like and what transformational work is like to get these seven money mindsets installed. And it's not just installed, it's awakened. It's unlocked in you. And then you start seeing yourself and life and possibility differently and you start taking different actions and you start being uh, successful at a much different level because the truth is when you're living in what I call the box that you're currently in, that's all you're seeing. You're not seeing past the box. You're not seeing the vision of what the world can be like in 50 years, right? You don't even see that vision. And when you start seeing that vision, you go, oh my gosh, I could do something about that. I can help that vision come to come to play. What part am I here to play? That's all mindset. I'm going to link that up and make sure that everybody in my immediate influence and network is aware of this. And um, I can't wait for them to come into that container and allow you to share that information because that's the first step in the unlock is just commit the time, focus, get there, and consume. And then now, challenge challenge yourself as well as look at the people around you even too and just make a choice to elevate it's so critically important i want to end us with one question here actually too i usually have a series of questions but there's one most important one that i believe um i'd love to hear your answer on and it's related to that sign that is right up above me there i'm not sure if you can read it but what is the one thing that you are most grateful for right now hmm the deeper connection that I'm developing with the higher consciousness and the evolutionary path that's taking me on that really is about creating a bigger vision and bigger possibility for the impact I can make on this planet. That's what I'm most grateful for. Beautiful. Well, it kind of goes back to that question that we were referencing before. You know, you've, of course, have prompted others to think who would you need to become and what impact would you need to make on humanity to become a insert number here in the next 10 years? And naturally, what I heard from that is you're asking the same question of yourself and you're actually allowing all of this stuff to download to you and for you to step into that. And that's pretty cool to hear and listen and watch. Um, and I'm really grateful for the fact that we got connected. There was, too. There was a purpose yeah. behind that. <laughs> Well, I think this is the this is the life that we get to live. Um, I've been working with people lately, and um, in fact, I have a, a contract that I'm negotiating this afternoon with part of my team, and I'm doing virtual events and virtual trainings. And yesterday, I met with someone who's been doing all virtual coaching and trainings and masterminds for 20 years, well before this became kind of in vogue because of a little thing called a pandemic. Yeah. And I- Teleseminars I, then. Yeah. Uh, I, Would have been. I know. I actually did teleseminars. Yeah, I did teleseminars. You're right. Everybody get on a phone. I remember that. Uh, somewhere I've got the codes for my, um, you know, get people <laughs> on a, but I haven't used it in years. I'm sure it's still active. It was, you know, but at any rate, I realized that I have no desire to do anything but virtual, that I plan to build out everything to be 100% virtual 
And uh, one of the conversations that I've been having the last two months, and I'm really surprised how many people are coming to the same conclusion I am. I like this virtual. You know, I was already doing business on Zoom, but I was going to lots of conferences. And I'm going, well, first of all, I meet a ton of people because of my podcast. And then like you, you were introduced and then you're introduced and then I introduce you to people. And then, you know, so this is a spider web at this point, a good spider web. And I'm realizing this is so much more efficient. You know, usually once a day, I have an hour set aside for three 20 minute conference calls and people sign up for them. And in in one hour, I can make a business deal with three different people. Why would I want to go have coffee? What in the world is that about? And, And I'm going, yeah, with Zoom rooms, you have breakouts and all of this. And I'm going, there, and I'm finding there are people who can't wait to go to a lot of live conferences. And then there are a whole lot of people that are saying, hey, this is a pretty good deal. I like this lifestyle, you know? Here, here I am in a jacket, but you can be assured I got sweats on or gym shorts, and, <laughs> you know? And I'm going, what, what, is, what is bad about this deal? I have not. I had this conversation with somebody this week. I haven't had a pair of dress slacks on or a suit in two years. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like I wouldn't. I don't By even know choice. what to do with them. But I tro- I what would I? Where would I wear them? Right. So what I'm saying is that this um, possibilities are coming up. In, like you know, I just want to throw this out there. If you haven't looked into the metaverse, go look into the metaverse. I'm excited. I'm going. I am going to have an incredible house in the meta meta world. And I'm going to have parties and people are going to come from all over the world and they don't have to get on a plane or anything, you know, and we'll give out little party favors and whatever. We'll have meditation room and it'll be super cool. All of this is possible uh, simply because we imagine it and then do something to create it. And that goes back to Walt Disney, right? Because he was one of the earliest imagining kind of people. And I guess I should, as I brought it up, I should give a shout out to Walt. I lived in Florida and um, I, I was not very old. My parents took me out of school and took me to Disney World the day it opened. Yes. And I like to think that I'm one of the people who's still living. <laughs> I think all the adults are gone. Um, it been a while ago. Yeah. I looked it up and I think it was... Three seventy five, three dollars and seventy five cents for children, and like maybe six and a quarter or six fifty for adults. It's a little more now, folks. In case you haven't been, yeah, a little more. But yeah, Disney opened up imagination, and then I've been watching a documentary on George Lucas. You know what he's opened up, and I invested in movies at one point, and I own part of Toy Story. <laughs> mm. Story, yeah, Toy Story. Toy Story and The Little Mermaid. And look at those. Those were all imagination kind of things, right? Yeah. And how much they actually uplift people. So uplifting humanity isn't just about getting water to everybody. It's uplifting the spirit. I think a lot of singers do this. You know, a lot of positive videos do this. Um, but my first million masterclass, I want to introduce you to all seven money mindsets, and I want to start your transformation and go deep on the first one and to go through process with you so that you begin to unlock at a much higher level. And literally, the right word is awaken. Awaken who you really are and what's possible, because there's, it's not that Elon Musk is smarter. He's just awakened more of his money mindset. And that's why he plays at the level. But one of those money mindsets is about being visionary, about making impact. To me, that's a money mindset in today's world. That's where all the money in my mind should be being made, is in that visionary piece. And that's what a person like Elon Musk is doing. You know? 100%. Yeah, and believing that it's possible for you. I know sometimes I'll speak to friends that when I ask them to speak out loud 
what does this future version of yourself look like? Like, where are you living? What's the, is it warm there? How much money are you making? Like all of the pieces that we can, in this physical world, kind of pull together. And I hear them say it. Then they go, yeah, but you know, I'm probably seven years away because I got this job and this thing. And I'm like, no, you're one choice away from that reality starting now or in a year from now or in five years from now, or you can wait until seven years is up and you get that pension or that whatever, but it's all possible. That's the thing. I've witnessed this in my own, you know, I'm 46 right now and I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years and I've seen people that used to say, you're crazy to then, wow, aren't you lucky? I'm like, come on, man. Lucky? I made choices 20 years ago that got me to this place, and I'm still on this journey. It's, it's not even ending. It's just continually ascending. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with everybody. And I, like I say, I'll make sure to link it all up. Thank you so much for doing this, JV. I really appreciate it. And any parting words? Yeah, I was just thinking... You know, all day long, you're making choices. The real question is, are you making them consciously or unconsciously? And I want to suggest that in the next 24 hours, keep a list and notice how many times you made a conscious choice. Because when we consciously choose, we can consciously choose the results and the impact we're making in the world and the money that we make from that. And when you make them unconsciously, You truly aren't in control of your destiny. It's when you make conscious choices that you're taking control. Mm -hmm. So good. My head right there was going to, right, so you make a conscious choice and you choose this, but then at the same time, the real answer is surrender and you have to, then you don't have control. I'm like, okay, I can see why people get confused by this and maybe a little overwhelmed, but lean into it. It's, uh, what's, It's really beautiful what actually comes when you, take on this state of mind, as you say. And these kind of conversations come out of it. So uh, grateful for you. Thank you so much for doing this. I look forward to our next chat. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Trevor Turnbull Show. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please consider subscribing on my YouTube channel and on your favorite podcast platform and leave me a review. I'd love to hear from you. Now, until next time, remember, today is a beautiful day of opportunity. Trust that you're exactly where you're supposed to be right now. So be grateful, be curious, and be brave. 